Welcome to the Wild Physio Podcast with your host, Andrew Wild. Today, I welcome Tanner Bishop on. Tanner is from Canada, and he's a certified strength and conditioning specialist with the NSCA. He has been training for 10 years, and from 2015 to 2019, he received a degree in business, followed by attaining a Bachelor of Science in Kinesiology in 2022, and he is now completing a Master's in Physiotherapy. His experience coaching and training university athletes, private clients, and youth athletes. Welcome, Tanner. Thanks for having me. Pleasure, mate. Been looking forward to it. We absolutely stuffed up the time zone difference here. <laughs> We're both yeah. we've gone off daylight savings and you've gone on to daylight savings. And anyway, we we got it all yeah. mixed up, but we're finally here. We're good. Yeah. It's a little late, but I'll do my best. <laughs> it's 10 30 over there, isn't it? PM. Yeah. yeah. All right. Not too bad. First question I've got. So you've got a different background than a lot of physio students have where you've done a business degree first combined with the kinesiology degree. What do you think has um, been a good thing for you going forwards with doing the two degrees prior to going into physio rather than just going bang straight into physio out of university, oh, sorry, out of school? Yeah. So I feel like I didn't really know what I wanted to do when I was graduating high school. Um, so business was kind of like a good, um, I guess like a safe option, like you're always going to use it. Um, and if you don't know what you're, what you want to do, you'll get a decent job with it. So I went into business, kind of got my shit together in the first degree, like had some fun, figured it out. Um, gave me a lot of time to learn. Um, and even throughout all of that time, I was kind of eager to learn about kind of working out how everything worked. Um, so kind of approaching the halfway point of my business degree, I kind of realized like I didn't want to kind of sit behind a desk and I, I majored in accounting. So like I knew I didn't want to do accounting uh, with yeah. that, but a lot of my electives were like psychology uh, and stuff like that. Um, so then I decided I was going to finish the degree and do something uh, like kinesiology to get into a program. And at that point, I didn't know if I wanted to do physio or like Cairo or medicine, or I was kind of narrowing it down. And then eventually I got to the point where um, physio seemed like the most in line with my values and kind of my past experiences and like it's also good because at least over here basically every insurance company will cover physio whereas yep. like if you're Cairo, it's not necessarily going to be covered um and yeah i think like business is just important in everything like knowing how business works and just kind of some of the foundational principles of the importance of how to run a business how the economy works just things like that are kind of very important if you want to open a business even if you don't own it if you're working in a place having a better understanding of like how to market yourself or like how finances actually work like yeah. knowing those foundational things i think is a good base um well it definitely then, helps because for me yeah. like going to uni i went straight into physio out of school and we didn't learn anything about business at university and then you yeah. go down the business route after you've been working for someone else for a period of time and you're very naive you yeah. learn a lot of things on the go rather than having training like you've had so you're definitely ahead of the curve probably compared to a lot of the other students that you're studying with mm -hmm. yeah and a lot of people in <clears throat> kinesiology and people i talk to like before I got into kinesiology and uh, especially physio, they're like, that's good. Like we learned absolutely zero anything about business. So they're like, like, I wish we learned something. So they're like, you're basically starting off on the right foot because you, you're starting with a business degree kind of going through all this. And then I think I was basically doing an, an undergrad in kin when everyone else was starting their undergrad for the first time, like I had mm. all my shit together. So like it was way easier the second time through because I knew mm. how to, and I knew exactly why I was doing everything. It was to get into physio. Um, I don't know how it works over 
like in Australia, but uh, you need like an undergrad to get into like a master's of physio here. You need, you need a degree to get into a master's of physio here, but you can do physio as an undergrad like I did. <clears throat> oh, okay. Yeah. So we, we don't have, so there's two, anymore. there's two streams. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't think that, I don't think it's, I don't want to, I'm not hundred percent sure, but I don't think it's anywhere in Canada that you can do it as a bachelor anymore. Maybe out West there's mm. something. But I think basically everywhere is transitioned to a master's at this point. Yeah. Right. Your uh, Instagram is great. And I stumbled across it sort of mid last year to the end of last year. And you do debunk a lot of the myths out there, which I love. And you talk a lot about the lumbar spinal flexion, which we'll cover later in the podcast. Now, considering what you do know and with your background, what are you getting taught at university at the moment or you know that is in the curriculum that is not necessarily the most current evidence-based practice? Um, so we actually got a, like, there's a new pro- couple new professors this year. Um, so overall, I would say not as bad as I was thinking Um, like going into it just from like hearing stories and stuff um, there's definitely like there's information that I can kind of see that I'm like I probably won't apply this just because I think it's either inaccurate or maybe not up to date but the MSK professor um actually like in every powerpoint he's got like long re- reference lists and like he he includes up to date um like systematic reviews and meta analysis of a lot of topics which is actually like pretty good so with anyone they're going to have certain kind of biases and stuff where yeah. you see things that I'm like oh I've heard that's kind of you know I've heard that's kind of bs but like overall it was it's definitely better than I was expecting. Um, I would say. The, is there anything the, specific? Is there anything specific that you have learned at university that isn't currently best practice? Yeah. So <clears throat> I'd say the biggest thing for me that I could speak on would be like the spinal flexion stuff. Yeah. Um, Cause I'm not a, I'm not a physio yet, but like body mechanics, a lot of body mechanics stuff. Don't bend your back. You'll lose points if you bend your back and like an OSCE or like a skills evaluation. Um, and then just like the general kind of lifting with a, a straight spine is safer than a flex spine. I'd say that's the biggest one. And just cause I've spent so much time dealing with back pain, um, going through that bad, like kind of sometimes bad advice and then researching it a ton. Like I have one of my pinned videos on my profile is like, eight minutes of breaking down why lifting with the flex spine isn't more dangerous. Um, so I'd say that's the the big one. Um, and then there's like, and and while, while we're there, let's, I was going to do this later in the podcast, but considering you've brought it up, let's do it. So it is, that was probably the post that was the first one that I really started following you avidly. And, you know, you're posting some really solid stuff with the lumbar spinal, the spinal flexion, um narrative now dive into it let's let's dive well, into why yeah different positions aren't necessarily inherently worse sure or more dangerous yes. yeah so that was like a that was a very in-depth video I'll, I'll give a backstory on that video just because of how much time went into it like i think when you watch it you can kind of maybe understand that like some time went into it but how long that was actually in the works of like me wanting to cover that. So there's a solid amount of time where I was kind of collecting information, making sense of this concept in my head to a point where I I had a pretty good uh, understanding where I was starting to come up with my own kind of opinions. And even when I'd see someone else say, well, it's not dangerous at all. And then someone say, oh, it's like the worst thing in the world. Um, and then, so on my break, my reading week, (laughs) my whole reading week was gathering all of the studies I had, like on my laptop saved from like reading them. I was like, okay, I'm printing all of these off. 
I'm going through all of these, highlighting them, like sequencing them in a video that's kind of logical. Like I'll start with this, I'll flow in to the next thing and blah, blah, blah onward. But um, so yeah, that was like, probably by the end of the editing and stuff like 70 hours wow into into that video two two weeks yes because like if you count all of the time building up um and like most of the days of that one week were literally like the waking hours were me working on it so Mm. either reading the paper like reading the printed papers highlighting them organizing it like editing on my phone and then i finally had it all in like a template that i could kind of go through and record so then i went up to my garage gym back this is back at my parents place there's a garage gym we set up over covid so i did the filming in there um and then that took a whole evening slash afternoon um, and then from that, it was like, I was doing it all in on my phone in splice, just putting it all together for like another, <laughs> and then I had to add the captions. So yeah, it was, it was a big project. A long, a long process. And if yeah. you could summarize the video that mm-hmm. goes for eight minutes into two, three minutes here while we're discussing this, yeah. how would you go about that? Yeah, so I'll try to remember. There's definitely some stuff in the video that I'll I'll forget. But the general sense, I'll start with the conclusion. I'll kind of work backwards because in the video, I do the opposite. Um, but I'd say the main thing is that people often get confused that spinal flexion is not inherently dangerous. That does not mean you rip your deadlifts from the floor like an asshole and you just like completely <laughs> discard technique. So when you're getting in like very heavy loads, it gets a bit more complicated because you have individual differences. Um, So like some people will be resilient as fuck in a flex spine. And some people will be at a kind of lesser starting point. They'll have to build up their capacity and resilience with that more gradually and more carefully than someone else. But the other thing you have to consider if you're a beginner and you're starting from a blank slate, lifting with a flex spine, versus a neutral spine and your your technique's good your load management's good like all of those things or your technique's good but like your technique's consistent you're not compensating to increase the load like the load's increasing appropriately with that given technique then your baseline's lifting with a flex spine so then theoretically like it shouldn't be any different so there's like a lot of nuance with that but the overall kind of takeaway is it's not inherently dangerous. So doing Jefferson curls with load or doing these flexion based flexion extension based exercises with load is going to, if you start at the right starting point, it's going to improve your resilience with spinal flexion. Not necessarily that like everyone should pull heavy deadlifts with high degrees of flexion, but if you spend enough time watching powerlifters, like I work at a powerlifting gym, East Coast Barbell in Nova Scotia, and a lot of people consistently, it's like flex spines, like pulling deadlifts, and they've been doing this for years. It's so it's isn't clearly not inherently dangerous for them, or dangerous kind of I guess at all for them. And if they happen to hurt themselves, it's probably no higher of an injury rate than someone else lifting with a neutral spine. Um, So yeah, that's the conclusion. Like doing, a, I believe doing Jefferson curls and stuff is reducing your injury risk and improving your tissue kind of tolerance and capacity in the long run. But it doesn't necessarily mean like you disregard technique altogether. Yeah, and you can't avoid, you can't avoid lumbar flexion anyway. And yeah, you can't. So that's another kind of part of the video is like when they measure that and weightlifters and powerlifters, there's like very high degrees of spinal flexion with only 70% of the one rep maxes they used. I forget the exact numbers, but I think it was like they were coming up to like at least half of the available range. I forget the numbers, but um, yeah. And that's with 70%. 
So you can imagine pulling a hundred percent, like going for a PR on a one rep max, you're going to come in a lot more spinal flexion. Mm. The other thing is visually from the outside, when you see someone lifting their lumbar spine, neutral is kind of uh lordotic. It's in a bit of like extension. So you see their low back flatten out, and then you're really just seeing most of the time you're seeing the lower thoracic spine start to round even more forward, which is naturally more like kyphotic. So like when someone looks like they're neutral, they could be an almost near maximum lumbar flexion because it's their blowback flattening out a lot. And it, visually, sure, it could come a bit more forward, but in general, like you're probably in higher degrees of lumbar flexion than you think basically in any exercise. So yeah, that was another portion. It's like, you basically can't avoid it. So you may as well be prepared for it when it goes like to those more closer to those end ranges, I guess. And how does that look in regards to training for you? And it sounds like you've had history yourself with back pain. Yeah. How does it, how do you go about training with say Jefferson's and that sort of thing with a week to week schedule? Like, do you put it in your deadlift day is it something you use as a warm up, or you're actually do, uh, building up heavier loads with your Jeffersons? How are you doing it? Yeah. So, and that's the funny thing. People might think that, like, I'm because I'm, I guess, very evidence based with the spinal flexion stuff. Like, you must pull your deadlifts like with a lot of flexion and stuff. I actually don't because I've had history of back pain. Like, I am still working towards improving that to a point where, like, I can pull with higher degrees of flexion, but I. Generally, I do try to try to stay like quite tight and like really use my prime movers, which are still going to be your quads and your glutes and hamstrings. Like those are the prime movers. Well, it um, becomes more efficient, doesn't it? Like, yeah, technique. A lot of people are out there saying the technique doesn't matter at all. But the thing is with it, if you optimize the technique, then the weight will probably move a little bit quicker and it'll be easier to lift. Yeah, so you're optimizing their technique. Um, yeah. Go on. Sorry. Yeah. Back to the, yeah, so I'll answer that and I'll get to the technique thing because I think the performance versus injury, like the theoretical injury uh, risk type argument is a good one. But for the Jefferson curls and stuff, I was progressing them like kind of heavier, like at the beginning. So as a warm up slash kind of prep. Mm. So I got up to like, I was doing 135 pound Jefferson curls, like so a plate on a barbell, like quite comfortably. And then I kind of like, I just kind of backburnered it. So just use either dumbbells, kind of body weight before. And I basically do them like most workouts. I'll just warm up with Jefferson curls. Like I'll just get my spine moving. Um, and then I use like a reverse hyper, usually like at the end of a workout. So today I did a pretty intense lag day. Um, so I'm not going to be <laughs> walking too well tomorrow, but I did the reverse hyper at the end of that. Um, and then I'll also do like, just kind of back hyper extensions. So those are like my main three go-tos, but I'll usually use the Jefferson curls as like a warm up slash prep. And then I'll use those other two as like more of a actual kind of finisher slash progression exercise. Yep. And deadlifting, do you normally deadlift all year? Do you deadlift once or twice a week or how do you normally structure it? And do you go through sort of waves of doing deadlifts and then getting rid of them and then focusing on more of your reverse hypers and back extensions? How do you go about that? Yeah. So deadlifts, uh, <clears throat> I was off of deadlifts for a while. Um, so the way I actually was getting back into, well, I tried all types of things for back rehab, but was RDLs instead of deadlifts. So just doing the RDL and I progressed that up to, um, like 425 for a set of uh, four or five, um, on the RDL. So then my RDL is actually stronger than my conventional deadlift because of that pull from the floor, uh, was just like, I hadn't been training it. So I did a powerlifting meet here, a couple, when was that February, maybe. A couple weeks, a couple months ago, probably. Um, and so I had to, I put deadlifts back in to progress them up. So I hit like a pretty easy 415 pound deadlift in competition, which like I want to be at 500 soon. Like I feel like that would be a reasonable 
place to be at. Um, but yeah, so since then I've been doing them basically most of the time I'll do one deadlift day and then one squat day. Gotcha. Um, yep. so, but if I was like specializing, I'd probably try to do those like twice, a, twice a week. Mm-hmm. Um, so I haven't been squatting as much recently. Uh, so I was deadlifting a bit more. Um, and then sometimes that will switch. So it kind of alternates. I'm also like really busy as trying to keep up with content. Um, I had to take a little break finishing the semester off, but I have like five videos ready to go now. So those will be coming soon. Um, so yeah, it's been, it's been busy. So my training's taken a kind of a backseat, but I've had this past week off, um, before my clinical starts. So I'll be doing, I've been doing like pretty consistent workouts, which has felt good. Um, but yeah, and then I can touch on that, um, technique. Do you want to get into like, yeah, that was the last question I had on this topic. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So like, I think that's the biggest thing I've kind of, I guess, I don't even know how to put it. I guess like made my own opinion on in terms of like no techniques inherently dangerous. It's like definitely true, but it's very, I feel like it is very much miscommunicated to people. Cause like the average person isn't going to actually apply that in the way that it's meant to be conveyed as like technically yeah, doing like a, I think it's called like a guillotine press, like on bench. That's not inherently dangerous. And that will kind of develop more resilient positions, especially for like your shoulders. Same thing with like Jefferson curls. Um, and those kind of variations of weird lifts. Those are not inherently dangerous, but it just needs to be applied properly. And mm-hmm. then you get onto the performance side of things. So if you try Jefferson curling, this is like an extreme example, I think can help kind of paint the picture. If you try Jefferson curling your deadlift, like it's just not going to happen. Your, your spinal erectors are not a prime mover for that amount of load. And I guess like the architecture of the muscles, you can look at your glute max and your quads, the biggest cross-sectional area muscles of your body those are prime movers in the movement and you can optimize your technique to leverage those better. Um, and debatably you can actually get better leverage if you do maybe round your spine a little bit to kind of like shorten the moment, moment arm and stuff, but like optimizing performance with technique is obviously super important because in any competitive sport, like pounds, make a huge difference or if you're looking at like sprinters like milliseconds make a difference so when you're looking on the performance side it definitely matters and when you look on the injury i guess prevention side um it gets a lot more complicated and i think that side is because people are so different that your tissue capacity in your low back could be different than mine your nervous system's previous experience with low back pain will be different than mine. So it's like so multifactorial that it's almost impossible to get like a consistent study. Like, Oh, look, um, this technique is dangerous because everyone who does it, there's higher injury rates. It's like, there's so many variables. So like for some people it could be, but for other people it won't be. And then maybe it's not even like a, a tissue injury. It could just be a pain response. So like, I could hurt my back with no tissue damage because maybe I'm super tired and my nervous system's kind of overstressed. And then that, like that bending over too quickly could kind of trigger that response. So I feel like it's just, it's a lot more complicated than sometimes it sounds. Um, That's my overall take, I guess, with performance versus injury prevention slash risk reduction. Yeah. Well answered. And Next question is on strength and hypertrophy training and how they differ. And you did a really great breakdown on your Instagram on this. I assume it took you two weeks. Those ones, not as much. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I got that stuff kind of locked away at this point, but it's up there. Um, 
Yeah, just like the main differences between yeah, the Yeah, main differences and yeah. how they would look with someone's programming each week. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> yeah, so I got a lot of videos on that just because I've like been, tr- those have been like my main two training styles for the longest amount of time. Mm-hmm. Um, before you dive a- into it, before you dive into yeah. it, maybe make a distinction between the two first. Yeah, so so hypertrophy training is training to make your muscles bigger, to hypertrophy them. Um, and strength training is, traditional strength training is training to basically move as much load as possible, typically for one rep, um, typically with free weights, but you could get, you could do strength training with machines. Um, it's just going to be within that context and there can be carryover like machines can definitely help your overall strength development but yeah those are like the main two differences um and typically your strength expression of strength is going to have a lot of neural components so nervous system contribution like how efficiently you can recruit motor units and how synchronized you are with your um firing of those motor units uh how much you can synchronize like multiple muscle groups contracting at the same time so like bench press your triceps chest and like shoulders would be like the typical prime movers um and then also the cross-sectional area size of your muscle so like how much area there is um like if you cut the muscle in half that's going to directly impact how much force it can contract with um, so those are the main differences. And then I can, if you want, I can get into like the main training, uh, applications too. Yeah, definitely do that. Let's, let's dive into that. Well, cool. yeah. So for basically for hypertrophy, like you need to train really close to failure. And like a lot of people underestimate what that is like within there's like kind of, I think the effective reps model, but like debatably anyways it's five reps close to failure generally you need to be training that intense to elicit muscle growth yeah uh, but I'd, I'd say like three reps in reserve at least um <clears throat> and even like two to one to zero and zero reps in reserve isn't actually failure the next rep would be failure after zero it's like the the rep you actually fail, fail on which whereas zero is you got, you finished it, but there's not a chance you would have done another one without failing. Um, so training really intense and a lot of people think they train close to failure and they, if you actually push them, they get like 10 or more reps and it's excruciating like to actually go close enough, especially in a higher rep range. Cause like, it just takes you so long. Um, but yeah, well, it traditionally is thought that like eight to 12 reps is hypertrophy, but it's actually anywhere practically from five to 30 if you have the willpower to do 30 rep sets have at it but i i like to stick on the lower end uh of the reps just because you can get your sets done faster anything less than five reps with hypertrophy you're probably going to be accumulating way too much fatigue i i think i said in one of my videos like you're a genetic freak if you can accumulate enough volume with like sets of three to less than sets of less than five so like sets of three and stuff yeah forces on your joints and connect like connective tissue this stimulus to fatigue ratio for muscle growth just won't be there um and for people who don't know what that is it's like basically how much stimulus an exercise provides versus how much fatigue it generates typically the fatigue is on your joints so shoulders elbows knees like stuff like that um yeah, I got, I went on with the intensity there. Um, I'll, that I'll was reel good. It back. That, that was no, but that is a very important point, and I've done several posts on that. How people okay. just don't train close enough to failure, and they think they are. And the research that we've had, especially in the last ten to fifteen years, about keeping a few in the tank. You know, the reps and reserve model of say one yeah. to three in the tank. I think people sort of take that for a bit of a ride, and they're mm-hmm. like, "Oh yeah, I'm leaving a few in the tank," but that don't have three in the tank or two or one they have as you said 10 or more and a lot of the research suggests that that people are inherently horrible at knowing how many reps they have in the tank yeah so uh, i completely agree there 
<laughs> yeah, the uh, the amount you like the last three are equivalently awful. <laughs> like I today I went um, probably zero reps in reserve. Actually, definitely zero reps in reserve on pendulum squat. And my quads after like this one hard set were just already so wrecked. Like, that's all they needed. Um, but I think a good a good trick you can do for anyone listening is actually when you're doing your set, when you think you've reached reached three reps in reserve, you say it out loud and then push yourself to true muscular failure. Have a spotter if it's on like an exercise that doesn't have spotter arms or something and count the, after you reach the number you Great. think at the remaining reps and see how far off you are. Yep. And it's a good, just kind of an exercise to do once in a while, just to figure out like how accurate you are. It's often you... nearly, it's a good idea sometimes to even do it on an exercise that's deemed inherently safer or it's on a machine or something like that to actually feel what it feels like. Yeah, you know, on say, a, um, you know, a hack squat or a pendulum squat or something like that, versus a barbell squat, where if you did fail sure. at the bottom, you'd have to, you know, tip the bar off your off your off your back. So, I think yeah. that's not a bad idea sometimes, or even just a single joint exercise to be like, this is what it really feels like. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I think then <laughs> there's no sense in like just being like, oh fuck it, I'll do it on like heavy barbell back squats, like just do it on. I don't know, a machine or something to get the idea. Yeah. Um, that can kind of bring us into like the strength training side of things. So I'll just like overview the main things I think for muscle growth. Like the m- number one is you need to bring it close to failure, if not to failure in the five to 30 rep range to stimulate muscle growth. You also generally want to use a full range of motion or lengthened position of your muscles. Um, some muscles don't necessarily fit that like, perfectly but like in general it's a good idea to use a full range of motion uh don't confuse full range of motion of a movement with full range of motion of a specific muscle if you're trying to like target your quads you can position especially something like a hack squat um to bias your quads more if that's your weak point you just like can't grow your quads you can bias your muscles through your setup to do that to lengthen them more that's kind of depending on where you're at. If you're like intermediate or advanced, you probably want to do that. If you're a beginner, I would not worry about that at all. Yeah. Um, So yeah, range of motion, intensity, uh, stability of the exercise is important. So you don't want to be limited by either another muscle group or the stability. Um, I actually just did a video, finished a video on that today that I'm going to post, but don't squat on BOSU balls. Don't bench on exercise balls to grow muscle. Uh, if you want to get really good at balancing on BOSU balls, then <laughs> go for it. But like, if you're trying to grow muscle, that's going to limit the percentage of load you can use probably below like 75%. I think Dr. Mike Isertel said in one of his videos, big, if you don't, I don't know. Do you know who Dr. Mike yeah. is? Yeah. Uh, for anyone listening, he's like big hypertrophy, very well known. Um, Renaissance kind of, periodization. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, but he, I think he did a study when he was in university of, they measured that. I forget what he said, but it was under like 80% of the like loads they could use on stable ground, which is basically guaranteeing they're not recruiting their high threshold motor units because yep. they're not handling over that load. So don't do that. Don't use unstable services. I think free weights are good as long as you're target muscles are the limiting factor. Um, um, but if you're always failing, if you want to grow your legs and you're always failing your squat because of your spinal erectors, then I definitely, if you want to keep squat, keep it because it's a good overall stimulus. But then I would go to like a hack squat where your legs can be the limiting factor. I'd say those are like the main three. Yeah. And then there's like the broad volume recommendations, but if you're training hard, you don't need to be on the upper end of those, which is like 10 to 20 sets per muscle group per week. And then there's variation based on the muscle group. But if you're, you're training hard, I think you can start on the lower end of that and figure it out. Yeah. And it's also optimizing the caloric intake and protein intake as well. 
So there's the yeah. nutritional side of things as well. Like if you're in a deficit, you're not going to put on a exactly. lot of muscle, if any. Yeah. 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 yeah I'll go uh, quickly through strength and we can touch on like massing versus cutting if you want. Yep. Sounds good. Well, yeah. So in contrast to hypertrophy, if you're like, if you're really dividing these two things, strength training, you're, you need to handle over 85% of your one rep max most of the time for those neural adaptations, because you'll be recruiting like those higher threshold motor units, uh, which you want your nervous system to get really good at that. Uh, increasing the intent at which you move the bar will also do that. So like if you push the bar really hard or try to execute the movements um, with a lot of intent, that's going to help if you're doing like kind of quote unquote technique work where the weight is just lighter, like you should really try to move those with good intent just to kind of optimize um, like that type of neural adaptation. But that's kind of like get into weeds a little bit. Um, so yeah, handle over 85%. In contrast to hypertrophy, you don't want to tr take your training to failure or super close all the time. I think once in a, every few weeks is fine. Or I think maybe one set, like a top set of an exercise, if you overshoot, it's not a big deal. But in general, like if you're taking your heavy strength training loads to failure, you're going to beat the shit out of your body real quick before you can before you can get a lot of progress. So even more recently, I've talked to like a few clients of just kind of educating that. So they're not going to failure as often and their strength just blows up because they actually can get enough momentum without getting too fatigued that by the end of a block or after a couple months, like strength has gone way up. Um, so yep. yeah. Don't train as close to failure for strength in general still has to be over 85% though. So like, that's kind of, kind of get you in a nice, like sweet spot, um, generally free weight movements, traditional strength, if we're looking at that and then picking your accessories to target your weak points. Um, whereas with hypertrophy, like your accessories are going to basically just be like, how can you fully lengthen that muscle and bring that specific muscle close to failure that usually won't necessarily be done on like a free weight accessory that will help your squat or like a free weight accessory that will help your bench. So like for bench, close grip, pin press, uh, block press, Larson press, stuff like that. That'd be like a strength accessory. Um, and then, but you can bridge those two and it's called power building typically. Um, so you can choose your hypertrophy accessories after a main strength movement. And maybe in that power building program, you would allow some of those accessories to be more free weight based, um, but following the hypertrophy principles to kind of get the best of both. And I think for most people, you can make really good progress doing that um, with not, you're not going to like optimize either one, but you'll make pretty good progress on both. And a bigger muscle is a stronger muscle. So eventually if you're strength training, like eventually you're going to want to make your muscle bigger so you can produce more, like more force with it. But I think you, you can get pretty far with neural adaptations for strength. Bit of a hybrid model. Yeah, exactly. That's like mainly what I do is that power, yeah. like power type training. Become a yeah. jack of all trades rather than just a master of just one specific thing within yeah. that realm. Yeah. Yeah. And then you're, you're adding muscle mass, you, like, especially if you want some level of like a physique or, or whatever, um, also just for health, but like, let's be honest, a lot of people want to pack on some muscle and, and look good, um, by whatever standard they hold for that. Um, and then being strong is also just like awesome and also good for your body to be able to handle whatever's thrown at it. So I find like the power building is a fun kind of combo of that. And yeah. then I throw some weird stuff to kind of complement my strength training, like uh, just variation, Jefferson curls, variations like that. Cause I'm also into that kind of resiliency building. Yeah. Sounds great. Well answered. And last question before I let you go, cause it's probably bedtime for you. The massing and cutting considerations yeah. dive into that. Um, how, 
one should be going about fueling if they are doing a really solid hypertrophy block. Yeah. So generally, like if you're trying to mass, you don't need to do crazy surplus of calories. You're probably just going to get fat <laughs> if you do that. Like, um, so like, I don't know, 500 calorie surplus is plenty, I think, in my opinion. Uh, that's like a true surplus. So that's not like I put a cal- an online calorie calculator and it says a 500 calorie surplus and now I'm not gaining weight. That's your maintenance. Yeah. Like if, if you, the, the calculators can be off. So it's, it's true, a true surplus, but you can even probably do like 250 to 500. Um, that's just general recommendation. Um, but yeah, so you need to be in a caloric surplus to gain muscle, but you want adequate protein. Cause if you're not eating enough protein to build the muscle and, um, to increase muscle protein synth- synthesis, then you're probably going to get disproportionately more fat tissue added. Yep. So general recommendation, one gram per pound of body weight of protein. Um, and then you're going to want to hit a minimum level of fat, um, which I forget it's pretty low. Um, so basically whatever app you use, whatever the lowest is probably still above fat. I forget what the recommendation is for fast, but I think it's like 0.3 grams per pound, maybe. Yeah. Um, yeah, you, and, you guys work in pounds. <laughs> yeah. I don't know what the conversion is for that. Yeah, like with the protein side of things. Two per kilogram. Yeah, with the protein side of things, it's normally 1.6 to 2.2 grams yeah. per kilo of body mass. Yeah. Or body weight. Um, so so that's, like, that's the conversion. Yeah. Yeah. So I'd say like the 2.2 per kilo of protein is, I'd say go with that. If you're massing, you don't need as much protein. So if you don't like eating meat or you find it difficult, then you can go on the lower end in a a massing phase because the, a lot of the carbs will be protein sparing because you won't be breaking down as much, um, to need to make uh, glucose or to fuel things. Cause you'll have a ton of carbs available. Yeah. And that kind of gets my last point is fill the rest with carbs because it's going to fuel training, help with recovery. Um, it's also insulin actually has a pretty good anabolic effect, um, on muscle tissue. Like some pro bodybuilders will just straight up inject insulin like, and it's, sketchy in my opinion i haven't dove too deep into it but like they will because of the anabolic effect so having higher carbs theoretically could kind of help that uh, response a bit more and at the very least you're just going to be very well fueled and have really good pumps from training with a lot of carbs um but yeah that's the general and then for food selection on a massing phase uh just to wrap massing up you're going to want to have probably lower satiety food um, so it's food that doesn't make you as full for as long, especially if you have trouble eating like enough, uh, highly, uh, calorically dense food. So food that's like per volume, it has more calories, uh, peanut butter, um, I don't know, higher fat foods are generally going to be more calorically dense. Um, but that can help get your calories in. Um, and then just get your micronutrients as well. And then for, for cutting, it's basically the opposite. So for cutting your main goals, fat loss and retaining muscle mass. Um, so you want to be a calorie deficit. You can go up to 1% of your body weight, uh, per week yep. loss without sacrificing too much muscle. Um, but that even can be steep. Like for me, that's two pounds a week and that's a thousand calorie deficit per day. So like, you might be feeling that. So you don't have to do that. Like slow and steady, whatever's the most sustainable for you. Um, you can go at that deficit, but between 250 to a thousand for most people, maybe. And then still 2.2 grams per kilo, uh, for protein. Um, it'd be more important, I think to hit that what's equivalent to one gram per pound of body weight. Um, on a deficit, just because you are kind of, you don't have as much nutrients available. You really want to be supporting uh, recovery and muscle protein synthesis. 
And then basically, if you're following that massing recommendations, then you're going to cut your calories from carbs because your fats are already at the minimum. Yep. But like whatever works, like if you want to go higher fat, lower carb, especially for fat loss, it's whatever works for you. Um, but yeah, if you, if you're following that higher carb massing phase, you're basically just going to cut the calories from carbs because you can't really cut it from anywhere else. Um, and then picking higher satiety food, lower calorie density, lower palatability. So stuff that doesn't taste crazy good that you won't be able to stop eating, uh, stuff that you'll be full after you're done eating it. Um, and yeah, stuff that's not like got a bunch of calories per unit. So don't, don't eat peanut butter for the protein. <laughs> if you're cut, especially if you're cutting, just have a protein shake or something. And keep lifting weights during a cut as well. Yeah. And then just training basically stays the same. I've heard all sorts of different things. Train hard. Um, something from like Renaissance periodization, Dr. Mike, as I've seen him say is like your, your maximal recoverable volume will lower on a cut and your minimal effective volume will kind of go up a little bit. So your zone of training will like, you'll have to, at the least you'll have to do a bit more. And at the most, you can't quite do as much as when you have enough calories, but like, that's like very, very nuanced and unnecessary to, I guess, complicate, like just keep training hard. If you're, oh, especially, if you're, especially for the general population. You know. Yeah, for general population, like train, keep training really hard. But I think don't let yourself slack off because you're on a, a, a calorie deficit. Yeah, and don't gonna, think you just need to do cardio. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Don't just do cardio. Like if you're on the upper end of uh, calorie deficit and like weight loss, you'll actually just compensate by lowering movement other times of the day. So like I think. I forget the exact number, but I think for every like calorie you burn with like additional cardio, especially on a cut, like you're actually going to compensate. Like, I forget if it's like 60 some percent of that sitting and not moving as much later. Um, so like, yeah, definitely do cardio for your heart and for your health, but do not just waste hours on end climbing a stairmaster or something like train hard with resistance training uh it's going to be way more effective and but you're going to have to probably push it a bit harder because you're not going to want to do it as much yeah because it's going to suck a little bit <laughs> probably not for like the the average person who's losing like excess weight but if you're trying to get kind of leaner eventually you're going to be hungry and maybe a little bit more sore yeah but it's it's doable for sure Thanks for coming on. You nailed it. Every question I asked you answered with plenty of nuance and you went into plenty of detail. So all the listeners, especially the new grad physios and the physio students will get a lot out of it. So thank you. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Any, any feedback or points that you think you disagree with or anything? No, look, I think you're on the money and that's why I got you on because I've been really impressed with your Instagram um, content and I was keen to get you on because of your background as well. The fact that you haven't just gone straight into physio and also you've done different things. Um, yeah. and I can also appreciate how long a lot of these videos that you have been posting, they take, cause it takes time to dive into that amount of research and also to cut and crop and everything, the video. So, um, appreciate what you're doing for the industry and keep it coming. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Some of those are, <laughs> Have I put some time in on some of those? I my earlier ones I was putting a ton of time into, and now I I got the formula down a bit more efficient. But but yeah, it's been good. No, it's great. Keep bringing them. I am thoroughly looking forward to these next five that you said you've got ready to go. All right. Hopefully, I don't disappoint. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Where speaking of your Instagram and any website or business handle that you've got, um, where can the listeners find you? Yeah. So just Tanner Bishop coaching on Instagram. Um, if you want to reach out or anything, just send me a message on Instagram. Uh, I'm also on TikTok, but I check Instagram way more. Um, 
So that's probably the best place to find me. And uh, I had the, my website right now is down. I, I still have my domain and everything, but it's not live currently. Um, so that will be back up at some point. But for now, I do online coaching. Um, so just at Tanner Bishop Coaching, you could probably put it in like the show notes or something. Yeah. Um, and that's the best place to reach me and see most of my content coming out. Um, and fun fact, I actually have a podcast. I had a podcast. I think it's still live on Spotify. Uh, but this is my first podcast of someone else's. So it's my first time. Oh, right. I thought you've been on one before. I've hosted a, like, I think, I forget how many, like seven. Yep. Like longer kind of episodes, but, but yeah. Well, you nailed it. You're born for Thanks. it. I got I got practice on your end. I got practice doing being the interviewer, but I haven't had to answer the questions yet. So hopefully it takes, takes time and practice. It's it's good fun, but we're gonna yeah. get this time zone difference sorted for next time when we do one. Yeah, yeah, we'll know we'll know for next time to check both every way to to search it. <laughs> yeah, Atlantic Standard Time and Halifax. Yeah, Halifax was the correct one. Yeah, yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Next time we'll sort it. Well, uh, thanks again for coming on. It's been great fun and the listeners get plenty out of it. So thank you, Tanner. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you for having me. As usual, stay strong.